Hello, my name is Ryan Hass. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And today it is my honor to have the opportunity to welcome Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tong, to our virtual stage to deliver a keynote address for this event. Minister Tong is one of the leading thinkers in the world on how to ad adapt democracy to our changing times. And Minister Tong is not just a thinker, but also a doer. As digital minister, Minister Tong is in charge of helping develop government strategies for communicating more directly with the public. Minister Tong is at the leading edge of a radical form of government transparency that has earned plaudits around the world. Minister Tong has worked at the front lines of countering disinformation. Minister Tong also has harnessed technology to ensure better two-way communication between leaders and the public, helping to make sure that a government by the people works for the people. I could go on speaking about Minister Tong's accomplishments for some time, but I will stop here. Minister Tong, welcome to Brookings. The floor is yours. Hello, I'm Audrey Tao, Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. I'm really happy to be here virtually to share some thoughts around not working for the people, but with the people, um, as I'm a minister working with the government, not for the government. Um, in Taiwan, uh, we countered the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic associated with it uh, with no takedowns. Um, and the reason why we could do that is through digital social innovation, meaning it's everyone's business and with everybody's help. Now, um, in the beginning of this particular pandemic, uh, we played the SARS playbook because on the PTT or the Taiwanese equivalent of Reddit um, in 2019, December 31st, uh, there was a young doctor with the nickname Normal Pipe reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's message from Wuhan. It has said, and I quote, there's seven new SARS cases, unquote. Now, um, Dr. Li Wenliang's message did not reach the Wuhan citizens until much later, uh, but he literally saved the Taiwanese people because people started to triage the message on the PTT of voting uh, with their expertise. And all this uh, reached the medical office, the Center for Disease Control uh, within hours. Uh, and then the very next day, starting January the 1st, uh, 2020, we started um, health inspections for all flights coming in from Wuhan and set up the Central Epidemic Command Center even before we had the first local case. Now, the PTT isn't um, exactly equivalent to Reddit. Uh, PTT is part of our social sector. It's uh, funding, it's by the National Taiwan University. Its maintenance uh, is entirely kind of self-governed uh, by its participants. The source code is open source, it's on GitHub, uh, and all its um, operation and so on uh, are serving primarily uh, the people of Taiwan instead of um, the advertisers or any particular shareholders. PTT doesn't really have a shareholder board. Now, the importance of such digital public infrastructure is most um, salient uh, when we see like Dr. Li Wenliang's message, uh, because this serves primarily a social function, a pro-social function. People contributed rather than, um, you know, um, labeling uh, each other, rather than attacking each other with conspiracy theories and divisive speech and so on. Uh, we very quickly uh, not only fact-checked uh, the message to see that it is probably legit, but also people starting to recommend uh, ways to uh, prevent SARS from happening again. And of course, in Taiwan, people who are above 30 years old, that includes myself, uh, all remember SARS in 2003. We were hit pretty hard, um, excluded from the international community, the WHO, just like this time around. Um, and uh, the central government was saying very different things from the municipal government. And we had to lock down the Heping Hospital unannounced. A year after the SARS, in 2004, the Constitutional Court said that uh, whatever we did during 2003 was barely constitutional, and there need to be a way for the democratic policy to counter SARS if it happens again, it will, will happen again, uh, SARS 2.0, uh, within the democratic authorization by instituting um, the legal protections for the people, the essential rights uh, and applied equitably, the quarantines, isolations and so on, without needing to declare a state of emergency. And that's exactly what we did. 
throughout 2020, um, there's been so far seven deaths, uh, but around the second half of the year, uh, life returned to normal. We held not just one, but two uh, pride parades um, and so on. And all thanks to uh, the institutions that was built uh, during the SARS and also after the SARS pandemic in 2004 uh, that enabled this um, mutual trust between the Central America Command Center on one side and the citizenry on the other. And we also made sure that the communication through the internet uh, also takes care of people's questions and so on without relying on you know, surveillance capitalism or other authoritarian um, infrastructures. Uh, for you see uh, the hotline 1922 that anyone can call to report anything that happens uh, during the pandemic is built entirely on domestic infrastructure uh, and with a very open live streamed uh, press conference where where the Central African Command Center answers each and every journalist's questions um, unlimited uh, until they run out of questions every day, literally every 2 p.m. And these two combined enabled social innovations to thrive. Uh, for example, people who called 1922 saying that they develop a way for uh, traditional rice cookers uh, to kill the virus but doesn't kill the mosque. That got amplified on the press conference. Uh, back in April, uh, there was a young boy that called saying, hey, you're rationing out the mask and all the boys in my class have um, blue mask, but all I get through the rationing uh, was pink. Uh, mask and I don't want to wear pink to school. Well, the very next day, everyone, including the minister Chen Shizhong, wore pink medical mask, regardless of their gender. And the minister even said that Pink Panther was the childhood hero. Uh, so the boy become the most hit boy in the class, for only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero wear. And that also enabled contributions from the social sector on the essential supplies visualization. Uh, early February last year, what we've seen is that there's a lot of coders, uh, what we call civic hackers uh, in Taiwan, many of them in the GovZero or g 0 initiative, volunteering their time to show, for example, uh, the pharmacies real-time mask availability. When people queue in line using their national health card, this is my national health card, which is an IC card, um, and swiping the card to get the rationed mask, now, nowadays is 10 per two weeks. Um, people who queue after them can check their phone and on more than 100 different chatbots, maps, voice assistants, and so on, um, they can see in real time the uh, stock of that particular pharmacy uh, decrease by 10, by 10, by 10 every time anyone makes a purchase. And if it rather grows, um, people will call when I do to, to report a anomaly. So uh, I call the three pillars of the digital social innovation in response uh, to the pandemic fast fair and fun, where the fast pillar uh, pertains to the collective intelligence and the rapid iteration of accountability of giving out accounts of the scientific measures. And the fairness pertains to not just mass rationing, but also the open API, trusting the citizens with real time open data so they can build not only um, the various different languages of mass availability map and so on, chatbots and so on, but also make interpolations uh, to the minister because we've never declared a state of emergency. All the measures that we do is subject to democratic oversight. Um, so for example, um, there was an MP, Gao Hongan, uh, who interpolated Minister Chen. Now, Eng Gao, the MP, uh, was a VP of data analytics at Foxconn Group. So she knows something about data. Uh, and uh, she said, according to the updated uh, every 30 seconds real-time open API, the mask distribution isn't quite fair, actually, as the ministry makes it out to pay um, to uh, show on the map, even though it looks like um, each person, no matter where you are in Taiwan, uh, who, of course, enjoy broadband as human rights, so uh, we can all check our phone and see the nearby pharmacy's availability is roughly even. It's not actually even if you take into account the public transportation time uh, that people must take on the more rural areas. So by the time they travel to the seemingly closed uh, pharmacy, maybe the pharmacy has already closed past its opening hours. Now, because this is evidence-based uh, interpolation, Minister Chen did not defend the policy at all. Uh, he simply said, legislator teach us. Uh, and so we began co-creation the very next day, and we introduced a 24-hour uh, mask 
a pre-ordering and pickup system with more than 12,000 convenience stores around the island. And so that, um, of course, made the MP very happy. Uh, and she posted saying that yesterday's interpolation become tomorrow's co-creation. Uh, and this is indeed a non-partisan or beyond partisan um, effort that uh, unites the entire parliament and citizenry together. Now, during the pandemic, uh, there's, of course, not just the virus of the body, but also virus of the mind, or conspiracy theories, and the uh, infodemic. The infodemic is particularly prevalent uh, when it concerns uh, the essential supplies. For example, uh, there was a conspiracy theories around, in, um, I think, April, uh, that said the tissue papers are going to run out soon, uh, and because all its materials are being repurposed to make medical masks. Of course, that's not true. Um, the tissue papers are made out of paper uh, and the medical masks are plastic material. But nevertheless, many people believed it and panic buy tissue papers. So the fun pillar in fast fair fun um, took effect. Uh, and we developed this idea called humor over rumor. And we did so because Taiwan was hit pretty hard by this information um, around the years around 2015 to 17, uh, leading to the 2018 mayoral election. There's huge amounts of disinformation and information manipulation. Uh, but because people around um, when they're 40 uh, years old, so I'm 39, so I barely remember the martial law, but people above my age all remember the martial law. So just as people above 30 years old wouldn't want to go back to the lockdown of hospitals in SARS. People above 40 years old in Taiwan don't want to go back uh, to administrative takedown and censorship because we all um, remember how bad martial law was. Um, and so we need to fight the infodemic and disinformation without uh, resorting back to the administrative takedowns. So what would we do? Well, we discovered that it is possible to make a vaccine of the mind uh, by employing humor. When people have laughed about something, um, they turn this outrage into um, a more creational, a more creative um, spirit. And then people can uh, worry together and create together on how to make solutions uh, without resorting to revenge or discrimination against one another. So uh, tactically speaking, we have this triple two rule that whenever a disinformation uh, or just a, a viral misinformation that has a uh, basic reproduction value above one uh, that's spreading, gets detected, then each and every ministry have a team of participation officers uh, that's uh, responsible to engage trending hashtags, uh, essentially. Uh, and they need to roll out the um, two different modalities, like one image and one video in the one, uh, and each less than 200 characters, so it fits on the phone screen, uh, and it must be very funny, um, and within two hours. Now, for example, the conspiracy theories about tissue papers, uh, within two hours, uh, our premier, the prime minister, uh, Su Jian Chang, wrote this out. Now, this is his backside, and it says in very large font, each of us only have one pair of bottoms. It's a wordplay because uh, in Mandarin to stockpile, tuen sounds the same as bottom tuen. Uh, and uh, this is basically saying uh, it doesn't pay to stockpile tissue papers. And by the way, tissue papers are made out of South American materials while medical masks are made out of domestic materials. This is truly hilarious. Uh, it's spread, went viral, uh, and reached far more people than the conspiracy theory. And people who have laughed about it um, remembers the comparison table, uh, would refrain from panic buying, and would um, more likely than not uh, share this to their friends and families uh, who get um, immune um, from the conspiracy theory as soon as they see this picture. Now, this is not a one-shot thing. This is actually quite uh, uh, systemic. Whenever uh, a Central Epidemic Command Center press conference uh, announced a new measure, the spokesdoc, official spokesdoc, Shiba Inu, uh, Zong Chai of the Central Epidemic Command Center, translate that into viral memes. Uh, and uh, this particular Shiba Inu um, actually lives with the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Uh, and so humor over rumor uh, is rather easy. Instead of um, you know paying for copyright for some trending photos or memes, um, they just take a photo of the dog 
out. Uh, and then uh, you see the social distancing explained in terms of um, three Shiba Inus between one another indoors, otherwise wear a mask, uh, or the outdoor physical distance two Shiba Inus, otherwise wear a mask, um, cover uh, the mouth and nose when sneezing, um, and as shown by this, like don't do what the Shiba Inu is doing. Uh, and this very cute um, photo shows that uh, why would you wear a mask? Because you wear a mask to protect your own face from your own unwashed hands. And this is quite a critical message because it link um, hand sanitation and mask use together. And it's much easier to remind one another to take care of one's own safety, appealing to rational self-interest, uh, rather than saying uh, wear a mask to protect the elderly or to respect the health workers and so on. Um, we make sure that more than three quarters of the population have seen this message, remember the message. Uh, there's much more hand sanitation and measure by tap water usage. Uh, going on after this message rolls out and most importantly people build trustworthiness um, like the, with the community pharmacists and so on who not only dispense the mask but also health advice and so on so we can all remain calm and collected and strengthen democratic governance even during the pandemic and infodemic so um, I guess this is a story of us building back better, um, of encountering a pretty bad epidemic in 2003 and pretty bad infodemic in 2017-18. But with people-public-private partnership, the social sector set the norms, discussed on the digital public infrastructure. We built public infrastructure for online deliberation and debate. Uh, and on those public infrastructure, people did come up uh, with viable vaccines, um, antidotes, solutions uh, to both the pandemic and the infodemic and the democratic governance gets reinforced, strengthened uh, during the twin demics. So I guess this is my opening keynote demos over uh, demics. Uh, and uh, I will welcome you uh, to follow us, uh, follow our work in Taiwan can help that us. Thank you for listening. Minister Tong, thank you for uh, that tremendous keynote. It was uh, uplifting, inspiring, encouraging. I think it's what a lot of us uh, need right now. Uh, I particularly like the idea of humor over rumor. Um, and uh, I think it's really important for us to benefit from the best practices uh, that, that you and others have honed, you and your team and the public uh, in Taiwan. If I might, I want to start out on, on this area because democratic governments rely upon the consent of the governed. And uh, consent is strengthened through transparency. Uh, it's weakened when there is a perception that the government is illegitimate. And in that context, uh, looking beyond uh, the twin demics that you described, what are some of the real world examples that you can point to of how strengthening transparency has helped legitimize uh, Taiwan's government? And how has the public been responding to your efforts? That's a great question. So in Taiwan, uh, we have the National Auditing Office uh, within the Control Yuan, its own branch, uh, for uh, the campaign donation transparency. Um, and although the campaign donation expense are tracked by the office, the office only publishes under the Freedom Information Act uh, paper copies uh, of the campaign expenditure report um, before 2017. Uh, and so the Gov0 or G0V, uh, a civic technology group uh, that I'm a part of uh, that uh, focus on radical transparency and accountability um, used to um, work with the NGOs uh, and went to the office in the control UN physically brings out the printed A4 copies uh, of the auditing report uh, and ask people to run OCR or otaku character recognition. We turn it into a game uh, where people can help digitize those paper records uh, into open data Data so that investigative journalists can draw their own conclusions. Back at the time in 20, I think, uh, 15, um, the control unit said, this is quite dangerous. Even though you say three people have looked into a number to confirm its accuracy, you can't be 100% sure. Uh, and we wrote back like, uh, of course, you have the public data. You should make it open data um, and free from the copyright constraints and so on, uh, because this is public money, like literally public money for a campaign um, 
expenditure. So uh, in 2018, uh, the social sector norm became um, non-ignorable. Uh, so the Contrarian did publish the campaign donation and expenditure as open data. And the independent journalists immediately jumped on it, analyzed it, and discovered that the social media advertisements were not listed in almost all cases of campaign donation or expenditure, meaning that our campaign donation laws, which forbids um, you know, extraterrestrial, sorry, extrajudicial uh, interference uh, into the campaign donation. Um, basically, there's a shortcut, there's a bypass through Facebook and other social media uh, venues. And that resulted in a lot of hyper precise uh, election affecting messages, uh, sponsor messages on Facebook and other social media uh, that are truly more anti-social than pro-social uh, during our 2018 election. So we uh, went to Facebook, uh, the civics integrity team, and said, look, here is our social norm. Uh, our public sector has already agreed with the social sector on the real-time open data. And, and if you conform to the social norm, uh, then of course uh, you will be seen as a responsible citizen. And if you don't, even though we don't have direct jurisdiction over what you do, uh, well, you may face social sanction because it's a very strong social norm already built. And so Facebook um, did publish in the 2019, uh, leading up to the 2020 presidential and legislative election in real time, the campaign donation expenditure as open data. So the dark pattern could be detected and also clarified. So there's not so much um, information manipulation on that particular front. And there's no um, non-domestic sponsors of uh, election-related messages uh, during our 2020 presidential and legislative election. So I guess that's a pretty good case of the public um, relationship uh, from the uh, social sector into the public sector and then extending to the private sector. Fascinating. You you were just speaking about the contrast between the 2018 election and the 2020 election. I was wondering if I could ask a little bit more about that. Uh, because in 2018, I think that it was widely reported and widely understood that there was external meddling uh, in Taiwan's electoral process, but we heard less about uh, the disinformation and uh, interference or influence operations in 2020. And is that observation accurate? And if so, what explains it? Is it what you described as, uh, you know, these these efforts and these uh, outreaches that were made, or was there something else at work? Yeah, the, the immune system uh, is definitely stronger uh, in 2019 as compared to 2017-18 uh, election. Uh, I'll just uh, cite one example. Um, there was uh, in November uh, 2019, there was this picture uh, from Reuters actually, um, that showed there's young protesters uh, in Hong Kong. Now the original caption uh, just said, and I quote, a teenage extradition bill protester is seen during a march to demand democracy and political reform in Hong Kong. Uh, and it's a very neutral caption. Uh, on the other hand, the trending uh, social media um, disinformation in Taiwan uh, says something quite different. This says, uh, this. 13-year-old thug bought new iPhones, game consoles, and brand name sports shoes, uh, and recruiting his brothers. And if they murder a police, they can earn up to 20 million. Okay, so it's the same photo uh, with a very different caption, a very different message. Now, because we already have an immune system in the form of a real-time reporting, uh, just like spam reporting uh, in the leading end-to-end -end encrypted channel, uh, that's to say the line uh, messenger. So people who have seen this message, even before it went truly viral, uh, they could just report saying that, hey, this is a very suspicious looking caption going on. Uh, and the fact checkers who are not government employees or contracted from the government, they are professional journalists uh, in the social sector, relying on crowdfunding and so on, traced this alternate um, caption uh, back to the Chang'an Jian or the Central Political and Law Unit of the PRC uh, regime, uh, their Weibo account, actually. Uh, and so um, we are, of course, quite tempted uh, to take it down, but we didn't because we remember the martial law. So we didn't take it down. Uh, rather, we uh, put out a notice and public notice, which means that once this is confirmed by the Taiwan Fact Checking Center, um, whenever people want to share it on, say, Facebook, uh, there will be a public notice and that says um, this message is proudly sponsored by the PRC regime <laughs> and its Weibo account. Well, it doesn't say proudly sponsored, but you get the idea. So people understand the frame around which 
that this out in the caption is done. Uh, and because, um, of course, at the time, people understood the Hong Kong issue is probably going to be the dominant, the determining issue uh, for our presidential election. So I wouldn't say there was an extra um, a jur jurisdictional meddling there certainly was. It was just detected early on by the sort of immune system of the civic participation and then clarifying in real time. And then with the partnership uh, with the private sector entities, the notice and public notice regime reduced the basic transmission rate of those meddling. Fascinating. As we all know, disinformation doesn't always originate abroad. It also is created at home. Uh, and when it happens, domestic disinformation often widens divisions within society. Uh, we see this happening not just in Taiwan, but in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, what can be done in addition to what you've already described about strengthening the immune system to help in democratic societies with free speech protections to reduce the scope and effect of homegrown disinformation? Well, in our K-12 education, well, as long as um, people are connecting to the broadband, which if they don't, it's my fault personally, <clears throat> broadband is a human right. So for the uh, schools connecting uh, to the internet, we don't quite teach media literacy anymore. Um, that's a last century concept. We teach media competence and digital competence. Now, the difference between literacy and competence is that the former concept um, assumes that the students are just the uh, viewers, the uh, people who receive information from mass media. But uh, media competence assumes that because the broadband is bilateral, right, is uh, people could actually upload uh, much more uh, than they previously could. And many primary schoolers are maybe having more followers on Instagram than I do, right? So they are all um, media people. They are all producers of media. Now, whether they are journalists or not, uh, entirely depends on whether they have gone through a journalistic newsroom work. So uh, in the schools, we encourage those very young people to, for example, fact check the three presidential candidates uh, during the debate and deliberation and policy forums. Uh, for example, we encourage them to build the air boxes, uh, which are inexpensive devices that measures PM 2.5 and other environmental indicators and publish it automatically on a distributed ledger so that everyone can contribute to climate science, but also pollution reporting and things like that. Uh, and so uh, democracy for us is a technology. This is not just about uploading three bits of information per person every four years, which is called voting, by the way, but rather a continuous input from the population. And once we switch to a competence-based thinking, uh, people would not get captured that easily by the disinformation anymore because they have participated in a newsroom-like process in contributing uh, to the general uh, sense-making of the society. And so they get this much more nuanced, much more holistic view on pretty much all the social issues. And that's part the basic education integration with the open government uh, partnership principles is part of our commitment in our national action plan. Well, Minister Tang, we could uh, impose upon you with questions all day uh, if we if we had the time, but uh, we need to let you go back to doing the good work uh, with the Taiwan people. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to share best practices, wisdom, insight, and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with you here at Brookings in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Live long and prosper. <laughs>